All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll say, uh, discussing my crime and the motivations behind my decisions, the decisions themselves that led me to prison, it's the toughest thing I've ever had to do. It's tougher than going to prison. It's very difficult. So I ask for patience. I'm doing my best. I'll give you an analogy. Imagine you, you failed a paper, and your professor said, um, you need to talk about your F in front of the whole class, in front of all of your peers, on tape no less, with everyone listening. That's in essence what I'm doing. I have the greatest failure of my life I choose to discuss day in and day out. And it's quite difficult, and it's humbling and embarrassing and sickening. And I say it's sickening because there was no excuse for me to go to federal prison. I was raised with opportunities and privileges that most guys in jail can only dream of. So I have no excuse, nor will I offer one tonight. Now, let's talk a moment about remorsefulness. Occasionally, I get some emails from students that say, or even some professors have said, you didn't seem that remorseful during your talk. Let me be really clear. When I was in my 20s, facilitating a fraud, getting paid, hurting people, I wasn't remorseful. I wasn't. Now I'm terribly remorseful, and at the end of this speech, if you don't think that I am, I shouldn't be invited back, and you should send me that email, okay? Let's talk about my parents for a second. Great parents, I love them. They love my brother and I so much. However, there was some tension back in 1993 when my parents divorced. They divorced in 1993, and for about 10 years, they weren't really friends. After about 10 years, they slowly became friends again, and Let's just say in 2006, when I called them and asked them to join me for dinner, they still weren't friends. And I called my parents on a Thursday afternoon, 2006. I said, Mom, Dad, you need to meet me for dinner. My parents said, I'll go, but I'm not meeting your mother. Or I'm not meeting your father. I'm not, we're not doing it together. And I said, Mom, Dad, you need to go. We need to have a talk. My parents knew very little what was going on in my life at the time because I had shut them out for the prior year for the most part. So my parents said, um, we're not going. I insisted again and again and again. And finally, they agreed. It was about 3 o'clock, they agreed to meet me. Dinner wasn't until 8. So starting about 3 o'clock, I opened up a nice bottle of red wine. I drank the whole bottle. I was smoking. Only cigarettes. Only cigarettes at the time. Only cigarettes. <laughs> Five o'clock, I was done with that bottle of wine. I popped open another bottle. Let's go to another bottle of Red Cab. I had a decent little collection. Started drinking that too. I had three more hours till eight o'clock. A nice build up till, the, till my meeting. So I was actually so wrecked before dinner, I couldn't drive. I was drunk, I made a good decision. So I walked to a restaurant called Daily Grill in Studio City, about 10 minutes from where I grew up in Encino. It's a little Jewish enclave outside of Los Angeles. And I walked to dinner, and my parents were there before me, and they're sitting on one side, one side and the other, and they're looking at each other with a, not a great look. And we went to sit down. And I had another bottle of wine. I started drinking. I started eating. And finally, after about an hour, my mother, who's very direct, said, so Justin, what, what, like, why did you bring us here? What are we doing here? I don't get it. And she said it again. I said, well, I want to talk to you guys. And my mom said, the fumbling around isn't working for me. I need to know why I'm here with you, and I'm here with your father. And I was pretty trash now. I was a good two bottles deep. And I said to my parents very quietly, uh, kind of nonchalantly, I said, um, I said, like, I'm going to prison. And I kind of covered my mouth a little bit. And my mom said, uh, $150,000 to go to USC, and you can't speak in coherent sentences. Why don't you try it again? She was very direct. And I said, uh, I'm going to federal prison. And a couple other tables around me looked. I said it very loud. I said, I'm going to federal prison. And my dad, who didn't say much, he doesn't really say much to my father. He didn't say anything then either. However, he gave me a look. Oof. My father gave me a look as if like, all the, the good I had done the first 30 years of my life, like it had washed away, that it meant absolutely nothing. My baseball achievements, my academic achievements, my community service achievements in that book because nothing, this look was awful. I'll never forget it till the day I die. And he got up and left as soon as I said that. Then my mother, who's more of a conversationalist, said, for how long? And I said, maybe five years. And then she said something I'll never forget and something I reference in my work. She said, I'm thoroughly disgusted. It's sickening. It's sickening 
had all these, these gifts and abilities and you took them for granted and worse, you knew it was wrong. You always knew it was wrong. You always knew it was wrong. She said it again and again and again and then she wanted to leave and I said, my, you need to drive me home. <laughs> I'm not prepared to walk. So I thought long and hard about that, not then, but while I was in prison. The idea of I knew right from wrong. So this is about as much ethical drivel as I'll give you for the, not, for the next five or six minutes, but I hope you'll roll with me. Knowing right from wrong won't, well, knowing right from wrong doesn't endow you with the strength to confront all of the challenges that you're going to face in business. I guarantee it. I promise you. I always knew it was wrong to facilitate a Ponzi scheme, which is what I'll talk about tonight. Of course I knew it was wrong to facilitate a fraud. You look at other leaders or once leaders in our community, in our society, someone like Tiger Woods, for example, he knew it was wrong to cheat and betray his wife. Of course he did. Mark McGuire, a former athlete at USC where I played baseball, you don't think he knew it was wrong to take steroids in pursuit of greatness? We all knew that it was wrong, yet knowledge in our case wasn't, it wasn't enough. It was insufficient. And in prison, I read the work of Oscar Wilde, one of my favorite authors, and he wrote a great deal about temptation, argued that you should give in to it. But he also said he could resist anything but temptation. And that's what leads a lot of men and women to prison. It's not knowing right from wrong. It's giving into them it's giving into that temptation, which is what I gave into again and again and again as an executive, thinking that I had to to keep up with other people. So I promise you, when you're faced with a dilemma in business, most likely you'll know the right choice. In fact, mo in fact most dilemmas are not even dilemmas. But it's very easy to give in make a, and make that wrong decision. And I didn't think about that while I was an executive. I didn't think about that while I was facilitating a Ponzi scheme. And when you talk about ethics, I think it's important to ask a series of questions. And without putting you to sleep, let's make it practical for a moment. Guys like me out of prison, professors like Dr. Sisko, we all talk about doing the right thing in a classroom. We all talk about it. The question is, uh, do any of you have a price? Is there a price that any of you could be bought for? For example, is responsibility worth something? Integrity. You're in the business world, someone offers you a $10,000 commission, a kickback for a promotion. You have to say one thing. You have to send a text message. You have to send an email. Is it worth something to pay that student loan or your mortgage or your insurance? When I was at USC, I would have said there's absolutely no way. There was no price for my integrity, my morality. It was not possible. But the reality is when I graduated USC in May of 1997, I found myself confronted with some dilemmas, with some challenges, and I wasn't totally prepared for it. When I graduated USC, I started working at a firm, everyone knew the firm, Merrill Lynch, later swallowed up by, by Bank of America. I was working at Merrill Lynch in Orange County. And at Merrill Lynch, I got off to a very good start, working a ton of hours, probably too much work, 70, 80, 90, 100 hours a week, progressing, cold calling day and night. That's all I was. I was a cold calling stockbroker, bothering you at home, convincing you to do a trade. Well. After about a year at Merrill Lynch, I made my first $100,000. I had raised nearly $10 million in assets. And I was very much working on my own. Moving to that first year and a half at Merrill Lynch, I came across a situation where I really wanted to qualify for my first $10,000 bonus, a big bonus. It's a lot of money. It will always be a lot of money. And in order to qualify for this bonus, I had to do 40 financial plans. In other words, I would go to your home, tell you for $250, I'll do a detailed financial worksheet on your life. If you want to have $10 million at the age of 60, this is how much money you have to save. 40 plans to qualify for a $10,000 bonus. I worked day and night to get there as much as I could. Every prospect, every client, telling them they need this plan. I really believed in it. I really did. With a week to go, I had done 37 plans. Three more to get 10 grand. Three more plans, they only cost 250 bucks. So I was in my branch manager's office one day, lamenting, telling him that I could really use the bonus and I'm so close, yet there's no way that I can get three more. It's not going to happen. My branch manager said, well, let's talk about this for a second. Let's, let's reason our way through it. And I said, well, okay, what do you have in mind? My branch manager said to me, well, if you were to buy three plans for your clients, $250 a piece, you didn't get to 40 and qualify for the $10,000 bonus. I said, well, can I do that? He said, I don't see why not. It's your money. You can do with it as you choose. 